All right. We're picking it up in Romans chapter 9. And we've been looking at these principles in a section of Romans where Paul is solving the problem. How is it that Jesus is Jewish? He's the Messiah of Israel, and yet Israel in large part rejected him. And God has a purpose. And Paul is clarifying that and giving us understanding into his ways. I don't think there's any more important understanding that we can have than to know God. So we've noticed that it's not the children of human descent that are God's children, but they're the children of promise through his word. And another <laughs> principle is that God's choice, he always comes first. So it's not because you inherit it because you're the firstborn, because God chooses the secondborn. And the people that we wouldn't choose, but he chooses them. And so he summoned, uh, summarizes it by saying it doesn't depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Mm -hmm. So it begins with God, mm -hmm. not with somebody deciding, yeah, I think I would like to do this. I, I want to be a child of God. So I'm going to, I'm going to work real hard and qualify myself. You know, I'm reminded of um, Psalm 27 because of this very thing that God comes first, right? And in Psalm 27, right near the end, it says this, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. So here's David with a heart that, that desires God and seeks God. And yet he says, when you said, seek my face, that's when I said, oh, I'm going to seek the Lord. He's behind a lot of things in our lives. So it's like, you're saying it's like him drawing us to him first. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. That part is happy. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to go back to Romans then. All right. And uh, of course, there's verse 14. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? Whatever God does, even though it's hard to understand, it's always just, fair, right. And it's an interesting, interesting thing. It's like a riddle. You know how riddles are hard to understand until you get the solution and then you go ah oh, that's easy mm -hmm. and i'm i'm remembering samson's riddle to his 30 wedding guests or part of his his guys party mm -hmm. and he says you know if you can figure out my riddle i'll give you each a change of clothing but if you can't get it then you got to each give me a change of clothing so he was going to do great and he posed his riddle to them, and they could not get it for a week. And they got his his fiance to work on Samson till mm -hmm. she wheedled the answer out of him. And then it was easy. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, they said. What's stronger than a lion? What's sweeter than honey? So it was easy after that. After she cheated and 
they cheated and got the answer and everything. Everything was cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great riddle, Samson. We understand it. So the ways of God are like that. They're like a riddle. And you hear that and you go, huh? So that we need the understanding and the explanation. And Paul is doing that in this section of Romans. Because it really comes down to the fact that if he's always fair and he's always just, and I can't figure out from my human understanding, I need explanation. I, I need, there's, there's something I'm ignorant of because he is never unjust. There is no exactly. justice with God. So it must come down to me not knowing all the facts. Yes. So this is what Paul is helping me with. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And in so doing, we all get this. Mm. So we've noticed that God said to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this purpose to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in, throughout all the earth. And we remember that Pharaoh basically hardened his heart until God started hardening his heart. And he says, well, so he has mercy on whom he desires and hardens whom he desires. And then you will say to me, well, why does he still find fault? Who resists his will? And you cannot answer back to God. It's like, so that was a great study last week, but we're not staying there. God is willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known. And believe me, he will. And he is enduring with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. That is, those who fill up the measure of their sins. They're not prepared by God. They prepare themselves for wrath. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. That is, God always comes first. So, promises, he chooses, depends on God. And it's work that he's prepared. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we finished up with this scripture in Hosea. I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it should be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they should be called sons of the living God. Now, you read that in context in Hosea, and you would get the impression that it's only talking about the Jewish people whom God says, you know what? You are not my people, and you are not my beloved. And here, what Paul is showing is that there is a larger application because as far as we're speaking humanly, Israel is God's nation. He made them for himself. Of all the nations on the earth, they are his. And that means that the rest of us are not God's people. But this is a word of promise. And therefore, we were not his beloved. We were not his people. But through Jesus, in whom all the promises of God are yes and amen, he calls us my people, beloved, sons of the living God. And it's, it's very much true. Before... We're just Gentiles, and now we're sons of the living God. Mm. So we're picking it up now in verse 27. 
Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. Hmm. Now here, we're getting this idea that God has always reserved a remnant for himself. And dealing with this very issue that even, even in Old Testament times, and God is Israel's God, and Israel is his people, but they're still not believing him. And they would fall away from God all over the place, time after time after time. So they did wickedly. And they didn't act like God's people. And God would turn them over to this nation, turn them over to that nation. And they would have to be slaves of some nation. Then they would repent and come back to God. So he would save them. And this is really the principle. Though the number of the sons of Israel, as far as naturally speaking, descendants of Abraham, are as numerous like the sea, it is only the remnant that's going to get saved. And to the extent that Isaiah says, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity, we'd have, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. That is, God looks out for himself, and he keeps a remnant for himself. Later on in, in uh, I believe it's Romans 11, that Paul brings up this issue of Elijah uh, complaining. They've torn down your altars, killed your prophets. I am left. They want to kill me. And God says, well, I've reserved 7,000 men for myself who have never bowed the knee to Baal nor kissed him. That's the remnant that God looks out for himself. And that's why Israel is alive today, because God is doing work. So. This idea, then, is that God works for himself to save a remnant of Israel. If he didn't, Israel would have been destroyed completely a long time ago. Hmm. So, what shall we say, then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Mm. Just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Mm. All right. Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. And we have to ask the question, how did they do that? If you're not looking for something, how do you find it? That's a riddle, isn't it? The answer is, does anybody want to try this first? Um Somebody came to them and told them the good news. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody else was looking for them. He told them about it. Yeah. It's one thing when you're looking for something, but when you're not looking for something and it finds you, mm. Mm. that means God's looking for them. Yeah. So 
They weren't even looking. They weren't pursuing. They were just doing their old Gentile thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Being Gentiles, eating a lot of bacon and Being pagans. whooping it up. Thank God, they said, for bacon. And then here comes somebody looking for them. Tells them about Jesus. And they go, wow. And they receive Jesus and they attain righteousness. They weren't looking. If anything, they were running from that. But God has a funny way of getting a hold of us, doesn't he? They had to hear that they were separated from God. They had to hear that. And, and that their sins were going to keep them from God forever. Yes. And be willing to, yeah, accept the truth about themselves and then look to Jesus. Yes, mm. that they're idolaters. Yeah, yeah. Who likes to hear about that? Yeah. This is not like selling a product where you can point out the good parts. <laughs> you have to start with the bad parts. And so that's why Paul and the, and the other apostles would get beaten up. This is hard stuff. And yet they keep pursuing Jews and Gentiles. When the, Gent, the Jews say, just forget it, get out of here. Then they go to the Gentiles. And all these Gentiles attain righteousness. By trusting in Jesus. By trusting in Jesus. That he died for my sins. I didn't know that. He rose again from the dead. Wow. Mm. You know what the proof is? The proof is that they became like Jesus. You know, this is how you know if somebody's right or somebody's wrong. It's how they live. And if you live in a right way, it shows that you're right. That's why a lot of these protest groups that have some cause, but they're violent and oppressive, and they do all kinds of things that aren't right. They show that they're wrong. They might try to claim the high moral ground but they do it in a way that is so wrong. They cannot possibly have the truth. They cannot be right. And yet that's that's also a trap that the Jews fell into because they tried to, like what he's saying in the next sentence, is that they tried to attain righteousness by the law. They, like, they tried to be so right, but in themselves. Mm-hmm. Yes. But they never could uh, get there. Get there. All right. That absolute rightness. Sort of a misunderstanding of the law and what it's there for. Right. Yes. A profound understanding. Misunderstanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did I say? Understanding. Well, <laughs> keep an eye on me. We're, we're with you. Can I just, can right I just behind me. Yes, sir. Um, I'm puzzled. I'm puzzled by the the remnant mm -hmm. because yeah. their scriptures, Jewish scriptures, would be clear on numerous occasions that a remnant will be saved. Mm -hmm. uh, through different dispensations, do the Jews go? Do the Jewish people ever go? Why were they saved or they righteous why was that remnant saved and not us and when it comes to the holocaust and the pogroms and the 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 the, the persecutions that they faced is there a re has there ever been a time when certain jewish people were were saved and and others weren't or is it just it's just the is 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 there ever a thing with the remnant that they are saved because they are righteous or they are. Well, here's the deal. Because the nation of Israel rejected Jesus, there is a partial hardening. And we're going to get that in chapter 11. 
and partial because Paul himself is Jewish. And there were lots of Jewish believers, and yet not the entire nation. So whenever a Jew is saved now, it's because he comes to Jesus. Ultimately, everybody gets saved through Jesus. Yeah. And now, uh, whenever, whenever a Jew is saved, it's because he comes to Jesus. Does that make sense? Yeah. There is no salvation apart from Jesus right sure. now. Since he has come. So are you are you trying to kind of connect it with um like times in history when you saw six million Jews? murdered but yet some escaped and are you trying to connect like that was a remnant being saved greg yes okay uh, the gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness so the remnant that is saved it's nothing to do with righteousness or it just well, happens yeah i mean in that respect god has said that if and I believe it's in Jeremiah. And he says, if my covenant with day and night can be broken, then my covenant with the nation Israel can be broken. Yeah. In other words, he's going to preserve them physically as a nation. They will never be exterminated as a physical nation. Right. There's a remnant, but it's not, it's not the same as salvation. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that, that would be, yeah, the remnant is not anything to do with righteousness or salvation. Well, it depends on what sense you're using the word remnant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be a nation of Israel. Yeah. Physically. But the remnant are those that are saved. And so God will preserve the nation, but as far as being saved, that is the remnant. Okay. I suppose because just because you survived World War II does not mean you're saved. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, eternally. Mm -hmm. so. so there's a distinction to be made with God preserving the nation of Israel physically on the earth. Mm -hmm. and most of that nation not receiving Jesus, but a small group do. So that's what I think you're getting at. That's Jeremiah 33, by the way. Okay. That's Jeremiah 33, verse 19. The word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah and saying, thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that there will not be day and night in their season, then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne. And with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. Impossible, in other words. Yes. So, I mean, this is an interesting part of Romans because it gets into the whole replacement theology thing. And it shows that Israel is Israel, and the church is the church. And the church does not replace Israel. Amen. So, mm -hmm. so, if I can get back to things here, the Gentiles are not pursuing righteousness. But they attained righteousness because God was pursuing them. Mm -hmm. Because it's by faith. And all they did was believe. They said, yeah, Jesus died for me. that's true. Because mm -hmm. that's what it means to believe. It means to acknowledge something is true. You can't believe something that you know is false. But Israel, but Israel, the they pursued a law of righteousness. Mm -hmm. 
and they never arrived at the law, nor will anyone. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Someone was pursuing the Gentiles. God pursued them. Oh. God pursued the Gentiles. Israel is pursuing a law of righteousness. Now, that's not the same as pursuing God. Mm -hmm. Because when you're pursuing the law, what you're doing is you are attempting to prove that you are righteous. Because the law has to do with your behavior, your actions. Performance. Performance. What you do. So when you're when you're attempting to fulfill the law, it depends on what you do because nobody else can do it for you. There is a, a, a strict division here. Not even God can help you. And there is some idea floating around that, you know, you just, you do the very best you can, and then God is going to do the rest. And there's a problem with that. Because you never know if you've ever done enough. And it works out in practice that you are unsure and if the truth be known anxious because you can never say you've done enough and you know if you're like that when you die that's not going to be good that is scary because if you find out you didn't do enough you're done you you have no second chance we have to get it right in this life. Now, the thing about the Jews, of course, is that they were convinced that they were right. They were convinced they were right. Even when Jesus told them to their face, mm. they did not believe him. They were utterly and completely convinced of their own righteousness. They could prove it. But what they did was interpret the law in such a way as to be fulfillable. The rule book. Well, they, they decided to figure out how do we fulfill these laws? And what they did was fulfill them by the letter and totally violate the spirit. Because the whole essence of the law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love your neighbors yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. But... When you have proven that you are right, you know, they acted in a way that was very unloving. So remarkable. Jesus comes to them and says, why don't you prove I'm a sinner? Which one of you convicts me of sin? And if you can't convict me, why are you not listening to me? So interesting. They thought they were right. But the way in which they were right was so wrong. They killed the Messiah. They pursued it as though it were by works. That if I do enough, then I can prove that I'm worthy for God to bless me. 
because that is the formula. If I prove myself worthy, then God will bless me. And the theology behind that is God blesses good people and he curses bad ones. That theology is not true. God does not bless good people. You know why? You tell him. Because he can't find any. He can't find any. If there were any, he would bless them too. All have sinned and currently fall short of the glory of God. That is irreparable by human means. It can never be fixed by a human being. We cannot make ourselves right. And the reason is all our righteousness before God is as filthy rags. And you know, it's not really appropriate or fitting uh, to make a present to somebody of filthy rags. You know? Um, just thinking about something like that. I'm, you're you're going to meet your, your fiancé's parents. <laughs> so you wear completely filthy rags. And you, you know, you say, hello, Mr. Smith. Good evening, Mrs. Smith. My, that's a lovely dress you're wearing. And this stuff isn't going over because they're looking at you like, what are you? Because you're wearing ripped, dirty clothing. Well, something like that. Now, I'm talking about ripped, dirty clothing that is not fashionable. You know, you bought those jeans with the knees ripped out. That's on you. But not if you're going to impress girly girls' parents. Can you imagine? They, they take the fiancé aside and say, sweetheart, are you really sure this guy is? He's doesn't look very nice. And you think, what's the matter with that, you know? Mm -hmm. But the point is, there's a thing about fittingness and what's proper. Well, and the Jews were convinced they were... They were fitting and that their righteousness was good, weren't they? Absolutely, they but it's... Convinced. So they didn't want to hear that they weren't acceptable. Yeah, you know, it's not it's not what you think. It's what God says. Mm. Yeah, like on a scale of my righteousness to God's righteousness. <laughs> you bet. I you tried. have to match that. You have to be eternally perfect mm. you know momentarily perfect mm -hmm. and eternally wrong doesn't doesn't work you have to be eternally perfect so you know you can convince yourself that you're right doesn't matter the real issue is what does god think and his his word on this says Clearly, there is no one righteous. No, not one. So, point of stumbling for them. They stumbled over the stumbling block. Mm. Just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Hmm. This was what it was offensive to the Jews when Jesus says, no. Well, he would say, like in the Sermon on the Mount, 
your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, or you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You have to have a greater righteousness. And then he defines what righteousness is. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look at a woman and lust for her in your heart, you have committed adultery. It comes back to the heart. It comes back to the heart. Now, you know, you can clean up the outside. Jesus said, you guys are like whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. It's in the heart. He says, you wash the outside of the cup. Why don't you wash the inside of the cup and then you will be clean? So it's an internal thing. It's not an external thing. So let's write that down. And you remember where Paul really figured this out is he was good on all the commandments except the last one. You shall not covet. Because that's not a physical sin. That as soon as you catch yourself coveting something, that's it. It's too late. Mm -hmm. And what Paul found was that when he realized that, he coveted everything. He found that his coveting went off the scale. He found it was all in the heart. And see, that agrees exactly with what Jesus said. He says, it's not what you eat that defiles you. It's what comes out of you. It's in your heart. Out of the heart of man comes thefts and adulteries and slander, murder, murder and every other wicked thing comes out of the heart. And that's why God says, you need a new heart. And he says, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take out the heart of stone, put in a heart of flesh. And then Israel will be saved. That's how it works. So God laid in Zion a stone of stumbling. And that stone of stumbling is Jesus. He's the one that causes this offense. Because if you're convinced you're righteous, it is offensive to hear. Nothing you do can save you. Mm. You say, no, that's not true. Mm. I can prove that I'm worthy for God to bless me. Mm. Because I go to religious services every morning. And I fast when I'm supposed to fast. And I tithe when I'm supposed to tithe. And I can prove I fulfill these requirements. Mm. It's offensive to try as hard as you can. And then be told none of those. Right. None of it counts. Oh, man, I almost got beat up one time. Because <laughs> I told this guy that doesn't work like that. And he was telling me, I go to mass every morning. Mm. And he told me what he did. And he was so big. I thought he was going to hurt me. There's a fundamental issue there. You bet. He says, don't tell me I need to be born again. Well, I said, you know what? I'm only saying what Jesus said. Well, listen, I go to Mass every morning. Well, good. But you're not saved. But see, then I thought he was going to hurt me, so I shut up. I'm sorry. I failed that guy. No. Here's Jesus, the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. You know, believe means trust in. 
cling to, rely upon. In other words, depend on. Okay. Mm. Now, if you're believing in Jesus, you cannot at the same time look at yourself and say, I am I'm looking at my performance, but I'm also trusting in what Jesus did, but I'm mostly looking at my performance. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. You're looking at one or the other. Mm -hmm. And so if you believe in Jesus, that means you are looking to him only. And not yourself. Goes back to the serpent in the wilderness. Well, that's what Jesus said. Just like Moses lifted up the servant in the, serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. So you look at him, and you'll be saved. Mm -hmm. So it's not that tough, is it? Mm -hmm. But when you look to him, you cannot look to yourself and see, how am I doing? Mm. Am I doing better? I'm doing better. No, I'm not. I'm doing worse. I'm doing worser. You have to give up looking at yourself and trusting in yourself and saying, I'm going to pull myself out of this somehow. You can't. You say, Jesus saves me completely to the uttermost mm -hmm. or I will not be saved. So Jesus only. So God has laid in Zion this stone, this rock. And Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. So that's what he's been doing with us, making us to understand that we cannot save ourselves. And as Christians, especially convincing us completely, we are monsters of iniquity. And you come to that point and you realize, brother, I cannot save myself. I hope everybody has convinced themselves. Have you convinced yourself? Yeah. I need thee every hour. I'm pretty much doomed without Jesus. I know that. So we have to look to Jesus. And then you won't be disappointed. Isn't that a funny way to put it? Hmm. Find out, no, nah, it's not true. What do you mean? Mine says, will not be put to shame. Same thing. It is, yeah. But shame, I always associate shame with like doing something foolish. But it's never foolish. It's not foolish to trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus, yeah. You won't be disappointed because... When you trust in Jesus and put all of your concern and burden upon him, all of your sins, and you commit yourself to him because he died for you, mm. then you experience him lifting the burden of guilt from you. And you get to experience forgiveness, and reconciliation with God. And you're not working against God or yourself. Because, you know, if you're trying to pursue that law of righteousness, you're working against God. And you're working against yourself. And it's a lot of work. And you get exhausted. 
and you do not attain or you do not arrive at that law. You're just going to find you're coming short. You're going to be disappointed. But if you believe in Jesus, you will not be ashamed. You will not be disappointed because Jesus does not fail. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we know that he paid for all sin for all time. And we know this because God raised him from the dead. If God were not satisfied by that sacrifice of Jesus, Jesus would have failed and he would have stayed dead. He was insufficient. But God demonstrates that he accepted that sacrifice, that there's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ because he raised him from the dead. That's why it's part of the gospel. Yes, he was crucified for our sins, but yes, he was raised from the dead. And that means his salvation is complete, and I was included in there. Well, I was just thinking about how Paul says in Galatians 2, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't set aside the grace of God. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. You bet. Mm -hmm. You know what? If all you need are 47 more commandments and you'll make it. <laughs> well, then God would have given them. Mm -hmm. But Paul says in Galatians, if a law could have been given that would give life, mm -hmm. righteousness would be by the law. But it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. The law gives no help at all. It just says, if you don't do this, you're dead. And all you have to fail is once. It shows us what righteousness is. Absolutely. It also shows us that we can't get there. Absolutely. <laughs> that is the lawful purpose of the law. Mm -hmm. Paul in 1 Timothy says, the law was not made for the righteous. It was made for sinners. Mm -hmm. That is the lawful use of the law to detect who is a sinner, which is basically everybody. Hmm. <laughs> it's to convince you that you're not righteous. You're a sinner. Hmm. Why? Just obey the law. I read, um, who was it? Ralph Finning or Charles Simeon? I, I think know. it was Charles Simeon. He says, all you got to do to prove you're a sinner is try to obey the law. And you don't even have to go all day. Just go see if you can go till noon. <laughs> God. And if you do that, you will convince yourself that you hate God. Ooh. You cannot obey the law. There's an enmity in you. It's just there. Because you really are a sinner. But if you believe in Jesus, you're not going to be ashamed. You're not going to be disappointed and find out, uh-uh, Jesus wasn't enough. He wasn't enough. Now what am I going to do? Nope. God raised him from the dead. That is, that's what separates Jesus from everybody. All you got to do to prove that your religion is right is rise from the dead. And without that, you're a wannabe. So this is why Jesus is the only way to God. Because he alone is the way, the truth, the life. He alone has risen from the dead and nobody else. So, we're not going to believe in ourselves, trust in ourselves. We're going to trust in Jesus and believe in him. That is our confidence. And we're not going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? We've had a question-y kind of night, haven't we? Which is legit. 
Anybody else have any questions? Okay, why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you pursue us because nobody's looking for you. And you're so good that you would follow us, pursue us, send people to get in our way and bug us and embarrass us and distress and upset us until we come to that riddle. Why do I need Jesus? And then we find out I'm a sinner and I deserve condemnation and punishment. We thank you for persevering with us until we realize thank you so much for being patient with us. Patient even after we've received you and we think we know what we're doing and we don't and we come back to you again and again and again and we're humbled and we begin to learn your ways. That we're to keep our eyes on Jesus. And look at him and his wonder and his fabulousness. And not look at ourselves and how am I doing? And I think I'm doing better. And, oh, no, I'm not. We don't have to worry about how we're doing. All we have to do is keep looking at Jesus. And we're not going to be ashamed. We praise you for that. Thank you that Jesus is our glory. We pray you, you would continue to teach us and make us learn the truth. So that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And so we can explain to other people, help us to get this. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Good night, everybody.